Hello there and welcome back to a brand new teaching series on a subject that is very close to my heart and that is divine physical healing. I've been wanting to talk about this subject for a long time and now I have the opportunity and the privilege but with the Holy Spirit's help to share from the Word of God some powerful principles on this, on the divine healing that will affect in a good way your day-to-day -day Christian life as well as the, the lives of other people around you. And uh, in this first session, I would like to begin with two questions. Uh, and the first one is, which things in this world are usually counterfeited and why? Can you think of uh, this question? The answer is things of high value. Isn't that right? Uh, you only see money, paintings, diamond, jewelry, counterfeited or faked by criminals and thieves. And you'll never see fake toilet paper, right? Because it, it doesn't have too much value. But only uh, those things of value are counterfeited. And the second question is, how are these things usually counterfeited? What is the best fake for an original? And the answer probably you, you know it or you saw it in movies. The best counterfeit is with is something very similar and close to the original. The differences between the original and the counterfeit has have to be very subtle and difficult to spot by the regular eye. Uh, probably you've seen in movies paintings, for instance, when when uh, when someone wants to check the genuineness of that painting, they have to call a specialist to look very carefully to see that uh, to see if that painting is really the original or a counterfeit and the same with jewelry and diamonds and with money the best counterfeits are very close to original in the same way why did i ask with this why did i start with these two questions because in the same way the devil counterfeits valuable principles from the bible and he does that with very similar things, but very subtle and difficult to spot, but fake and unbiblical. And he managed to do that in many areas of Christian life, but mostly in three main areas. Uh, he has thrown a lot of confusion in the body of Christ. And by doing that, he managed to rob Christians of powerful benefits of, uh, of our inheritance in Jesus Christ that God has given to, to the new creation and for which Jesus Christ Christ has paid a high price at the cross and those things these three these areas are divine physical healing financial prosperity and speaking in tongues and in this series we'll talk about divine physical healing and whenever I refer to healing I will be talking mostly about physical healing and not about mental emotional or spiritual healing although those are included fully included in the gospel but here i'll refer to physical healing and i'll begin with two powerful statements actually i'll begin with the end of this series uh, with two powerful statements that we are going to prove from the bible throughout all these series and these are the following the divine that divine physical healing is freely and fully included in the gospel and in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross side by side with forgiveness of sins, justification, and sanctification. The perfect will of God for those who are in Christ is to walk in continuous health both for themselves and for others by healing anybody, anytime, anywhere. It's one of their birthrights. It's one of our birthrights as a new creation in Christ Jesus is one of your birthrights. To have health, continuous health, to be able to heal yourself by, by the power of the Holy Spirit and to heal other people around you of any sickness, any disease uh, that they might be uh, affected by. The second powerful statement is divine physical healing is an integral part of salvation and of being born again. Justification and remission of sins is the salvation of the spirit. Sanctification or mind renewal is salvation of the soul, mind, will, and emotions. And physical healing is salvation of the physical body. 
don't panic. We'll talk in detail about this statement. And this is, this is the core of this teaching series. This is what I'm trying to prove from the Bible. Uh, that salvation is not just salvation from hell in the future life. That's only a part of salvation. Salvation is, is a whole. It's, it comes from the Greek sozo. You are saved here on earth. Salvation manifests in all areas of your life. If you're sick, salvation means healing. In your financial day-to-day uh, uh, -day provision, salvation means provision, means finance, means prosperity, means a blessing, financial blessing in, uh, in, the, in the area of holiness. Salvation is sanctification, being able to walk in the newness of life, in the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So salvation has to do with the very life of God manifested from, through us in every aspect of our life. Salvation has to do with spiritual life that Jesus Christ has come to give us in abundance, life. Life, life for your bank account is money in that bank account. Life for your body is physical healing. Life for your spirit is the, is the, the new creation and the self, remission of sins. Amen? So I, I want us to change a little bit our perspective and our mindset when you look at salvation. That prayer that you said when you got saved from Romans 10, 9 to 10, when you believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is your Lord and He was resurrected, and then you confessed that He is the Lord of your life, you were saved. Because with the faith in the heart and with the confession of the mouth, you you with by by when you believe in your heart, you come to righteousness. And when you confess with your mouth, you come to salvation. And salvation includes everything and includes a lot for this life while you are on earth and a lot for the future, future life. God has not given us a salvation that is just for the future life. And this is where a lot of Christians don't uh, miss it or don't understand. He didn't just save us from hell and here while we're on earth, oh, I'm going to leave you there. You just have to endure and be faithful and go through all. Uh, um, uh, I'll allow everything from darkness to, tramp, to trample upon you, to, put, to trample uh, on the, uh, to put you down, but you will make it. No, the Lord has provided for us in salvation power. Power to overcome this world, to overcome every sin, to overcome every sickness, to overcome every uh, every problem, frustration, fear, depression, and the every suffering. And I want to say another powerful step: every suffering in this world is a work of darkness, and it has to be destroyed. The only exception, uh, uh, the only suffering that the Bible tells us to endure and not overcome, the only uh, acceptable and biblical suffering is the persecution for the name of Jesus Christ. And you know why? Because that kind of suffering comes through other people, which involves other people's will and involves other people that God loves. Even though they are enemies to God and they may say things, they may persecute you for the name of Jesus, God still loves them as he loved you. And that's why he tells us to love them. We cannot destroy them because the devil, although the devil is using them to persecute you and, the pers and persecute the name of Jesus, God loves them and wants them saved and as well as he wanted you saved. He wants them to come in the family of God. And that's why, and also for the glory of God, it's, it's something glorious to suffer for the name of Jesus and for the name of God when it's, when it's persecution. But when it comes to sickness, when it comes to uh, lack, poverty, curse, these are things that entered in this world once sin entered the world. They are the effects of sin. And when the Bible says in Romans 6, 14, that sin shall not have dominion over you because you are under grace, it means that all the things that came in the world with sin shall not have dominion over you. Sinful habits, sickness, lack, poverty, fear, depression, uh, all these things should not have dominion. They don't have dominion over you. And um, that's why they are works of darkness and they, we are called to destroy them. And we will see that while, as we go as we go on, move forward throughout this session. But I want to stir your appetite that we have a, a great inheritance, a rich inheritance beyond, beyond measure 
that God has given us here on earth through the gospel. And uh, I would like to kind of map out uh, our, our study throughout this whole series. We will have like eight big chapters or sections. And these are, uh, we are going to define first what is divine healing. We are going to discuss about God's will on divine healing. And then answer on the third section, the usual ob objections to healing. Then fourth, we will describe some false of obstacles to healing then we'll describe some valid obstacles to, to healing then we'll learn about how to believe how to have faith and about the main law of the kingdom which is faith in the word and then finally we'll talk about how to minister healing successfully to yourself and to other people so we have a lot of things to cover we'll cover we'll talk about uh, paul's thorn we'll talk about job sufferings and all the usual objections that uh, christians usually bring so because you need to be fully persuaded fully convinced in order to grow in faith in this area and to see healing manifested more and more in an increasing increasing measure in your life uh, and all these big chapters eight big chapters will have also uh, subsections why do we need to learn about this subject this is important why should we learn about this subject the obvious reason is that almost anybody in this life will need at least one time but we know that it's many times at least one time will need healing in their life from a sickness from a disease that's something that affects their body because we live in a world where darkness reigns where where darkness uh, we're see in a fallen world we 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 call it and sickness and disease is very normal in this world but not for christians but still those attack christians but we have the power to overcome it so because we experience sickness, we need this message. We need to know how can we live in continuous health through the power of the gospel. And then why? Because it's freely provided at the cross. It's free. It's free. It's healing provided free from any sickness, any disease for anyone, anytime, anywhere. Even those that are incurable. Doctors, they are actually our allies because they are trying to seek healing and solutions to sicknesses and disease by natural ways but there's a limit to what they can do and the, uh, but the gospel the power of god has no limits it can heal anything so that that should be a great motivation to study this subject and there are so many sicknesses and disease diseases today that cannot be cured medically as i said but they they can be cured supernaturally so I hope this was like an introduction. I hope I stirred your appetite for this subject. So let's begin with the first, the first big chapter or, or section, which is called Foundational Truths and Definitions. And the first subsection in this big chapter is the Word is the final authority. The Word of God is the final authority in any area of our lives. And we need to understand this thing and not waver uh, and back and forth from this because I want I want us to understand that there will always be a conflict and a gap so or a tension between what the word of God says about your life and what you're supposed to experience and the actual reality or experience that you see that you feel that you hear there will always be a conflict and especially that is true in the area of healing you know in when when you're saved it's very easy to believe. I mean, it's easier to believe because the moment of salvation, the salvation uh, for forgiveness of sins has to do with something in the past and something in the future, mainly. And it's something that you don't have to see immediately. It has to do with the fact that Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago for all your sins. And it has to do with the future life that one day when Jesus comes again, you'll live with God. But the things that from the gospel that we have to believe here on this earth while we live here, especially in, on the air of healing, when we pray for someone, we need to see tangible results. And because we don't see them, then there's a conflict. We don't sometimes, most of the time we don't see them. Uh, the, uh, that creates a conflict and we have a choice. 
uh, one choice is to accommodate to adjust the Bible to fit the experience or enforce the Bible to, to change the experience. Enforce what the Bible says to change that experience. And uh, here it's a fight, it, uh, actually a fight of faith. And sadly, many Christians choose the other way where they try to fit the Bible, to, to change the by what the Lord says, to interpret verses that refer to physical healing, interpret them as referring to spiritual, emotional healing, something that you cannot see tangible. It's something very vague, ambiguous, and it, it happens in a long time, and it's easier to believe. And they try to adjust, even unconsciously and innocent. I'm not talking about an evil intention to change the Bible, but because we cannot reconcile that, we don't see every day and very easily people healed, then we tend to change the Bible to fit the, the, the experience. And that's what this series is all about. We're trying to enforce the Bible to change the experience because the experiences can be changed. And I would like to, to begin by reading one uh, a first passage from Isaiah uh, 55, verse 11. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you, can, you are free to use any other version that you have available. And if you have it opened, opened uh, already, let's read it together. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Can we read? This is so powerful. I will read it again. So shall my word be, says God, that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God always speaks on purpose. He never makes waste of words like us. We talk and talk and that and, uh, and that and that, and we waste so many words, but God never wastes his words. And everything he says, he expects it to come to pass. When he said in 1 Peter 2, 24, that G by Jesus' stripes we were healed, God expects that word to come to pass in our everyday life. The Word of God will always work. This is a powerful thing. The Word of God, what God has said from His mouth, will always work. It will always be successful. It will always accomplish what it was sent for, and it will always prosper. Let's read another passage from Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. It says this, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has, has he said and will he not do? Ha, or has he spoken and will he not make it good? God never says something and then changes his mind. Like, like we do. Never. Once he said it, it's eternal and forever being fulfilled. There are things that God has spoken that they are eternal, forever being fulfilled. And he, God doesn't change his mind. And this is important. That's why I'm taking the time to lay this foundation about the Word of God and we'll see about the new creation mindset. Let's read one more passage from Mark chapter 13, verse 31. I love the Word of God. Let's read it together. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. The words that God speaks at one time remain forever in place. They don't pass away. This is powerful. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's words will never pass away. Psalm 119 verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. I love this passage. I like this passage. The word of God is forever settled, decided, firm, established in the heavenly realm. There is no change or doubt about it. There is no angel or heavenly creature ever doubting that the word that God has said will not come to pass. What God said remains valid and works forever. Only we people have doubts that what God has said will 
come to pass or it will not come to pass. So what do we need to do? That word that is settled in heaven, we need to settle it on earth. It's not settled yet on earth. But we as Christians, as new creations, we need to enforce it and establish it on earth exactly as it is in heaven. This is what Jesus says in his prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, when Matthew, Matthew 6 verse 10. And also you, you find the same, um, the same uh, the Lord's Prayer in Luke and Mark. But in Matthew 6 10, Jesus prays like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so he calls that will of god that the words that god has spoken and are settled in heaven to be established also on earth psalm 138 verse 2 is in the same context i will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth for you have magnified your word above all your name. You know, a person's reputation is very much dependent on that person's word, on how much or how much that person keeps his or her word when he says something. In other words, your name is as good as how much you keep your word. Isn't that right? Haven't you met people that said big things or promised a lot of things, but about whom you knew in that moment that they will not keep their promise? Their word meant nothing because most of the times they will not keep that their promise. And you, I don't like that those kind of people, and probably you don't like them too because you cannot. They are not reliable. You cannot rely on them on what they say. So that person's reputation is very much connected with how much they keep your, their word. And in the same way, God is God as much as he keeps his word. If God doesn't keep his word, what, what, what will happen? If, that, if God doesn't keep his word, he, can, he cannot be God anymore. He is not God anymore because that's what makes him God. He must keep his word, not because we put him in a corner, not because we force him to do, but because he forced himself. When he said what he said, he forced, he uh, obligated himself to fulfill his word. Because when he says, if he doesn't do what he said, then his reputation is, as a God is lowered. And God doesn't get to pick or choose. These are powerful principles. God doesn't get to pick or choose which words to keep or not. God had the right and the ability to pick the words that he wanted to say, but once he said them, he doesn't have the right to pick which words he will uphold or keep. He chooses his words very carefully and he only says that which he will do. Remember King Darius and Daniel in Daniel 6? If you want to read it, you can read the whole passage, how King Darius uh, gave a decree. He was deceived by some of his administrators to give a decree that no one will worship anyone else or anything else except the king for a, a period of time. And then when Daniel went and worshipped God the same way he did uh, three times a day, and those evil people brought Daniel to the king and the, uh, they told to the king, you gave the decree that anyone who worships something else will be thrown in the lion's den. And when King Darius saw that, the Bible says that he was greatly distressed because he loved Daniel and he was planning to put him uh, as head over all uh, his kingdom, as the, uh, the administrator over all his kingdom. And he was greatly distressed that he had to throw Daniel in the lion's den because of his decree. And no matter how much he tried to save Daniel, he couldn't take back his decree, his word. He, uh, and he could not save Daniel from the lines that he had to keep as a king that decree. Otherwise, he would undermine his authority. And then we, we, we see King Herod in Mark 6, in the Gospel of Mark, when uh, Herodias' daughter danced in front of him. He gave a party for his uh, high officials here, military commanders. And Herodias' daughter danced in front of him. And he liked it so much that he... Uh, he he told her that he would give her anything she would ask in front of everybody. 
even half of the kingdom. And when the, when the daughter asked, uh, uh, her mother's advice, asked for John the Baptist's head, King Herod didn't expect that. He didn't want, he, was, he feared to do that. He didn't want to kill John the Baptist. But because he gave his word in front of all his officials, he could not take it back. And the Bible again says the same thing, that Herod was greatly distressed but he could not take back his word. So he, he sent someone to cut uh, John Baptist's head, to take his head and bring it on a plate. But now, why did I brought, uh, bring these examples to you? Because if, if earthly things, if earthly kings had to keep their word in such a, uh, uh, such a strong way, how much more God, who is God, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, when he says something, he cannot take it back. Not because we force him, but because he is God and he has to keep his word. And he can never take back his word or change his mind. And in the Old Testament, uh, as we saw in the passage that we read in Psalm 138 verse 2, in the Old Testament, God revealed himself and his character to people in a progressive way. And how did he do that? He revealed what he wanted to be to them on a regular basis or in their hour of need by using different names like Elohim, which means, which means God, creator, mighty and strong. These na- this name was used at the creation when God created the world. Then El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. Adonai, which means Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh Jireh, Yahweh Jireh which means the Lord will provide. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace. So we see that God is God Almighty, all-powerful. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is the provider. He is the healer. He is the banner. He is the peace. He is our peace, our wholeness. And to say that God doesn't heal anymore in the New Testament is to say that God changed his character. His word encapsulates all his name, all his character. So that's why the the psalmist says that the word of God is magnified above all his names. Because all these names have uh, revealed only a part of God, only a a facet, uh, one of, of his one part of his nature, but not the whole thing. But the word of God encapsulates all these names. So if God healed in the Old Testament and he was the healer, he, the word, much more in the New Testament, he remains the healer and he wants to heal his people. And not only his people, even people from outside his family and his kingdom. His character is healing. He wants to heal. His will is to heal us. Let's move on in Malachi verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. So the passage above says, in other words, sons of Jacob, you are lucky that I don't change. Because I should consume you because of what you're doing. I should punish you, but you are lucky I don't change. Otherwise, you would be consumed by now. But what I said, I will not change my mind. I will spare you. So God doesn't change. Then we see again in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same all the time. You know, there's a difference between truth and fact. Facts can be seen by anybody. And many times we confuse it with truth, but it's not, they are not one and the same thing. Truth is truth regardless of facts. And God's word is truth. A doctor can look at your report or your x-ray and give you, and he can give you the facts. What he has seen with his natural eyes, his natural perspective, his natural mindset. But he might not have the truth, the reality. And if you stand on the truth, the facts will change. Now, people want to take what their body tells them as truth rather than fact. And facts. And that is true, especially in the area of sicknesses. You want to take as truth, we take as truth 
what the body tells us. If you feel a headache, you feel something is wrong in your body, you tell it, you, you, you take it as truth, but it's just a fact that can change, it's changeable. And uh, the body, if you didn't know, your body changes a lot. As, as, if you take a look at a picture of you from 20 years ago or 10 years ago, you will see that your body changed a lot. So facts about your body are changeable and truth, the truth from the Bible changes those facts. Let's read one more passage from the Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Through who? Through the Word. All things. And without Him, without the Word, nothing was made that was made. In Him, in the Word, was life. And the life was the light of man. So we see from this passage so powerful that the word of God is the same thing as God. Everything that was created in this world was through the word. And the, this word has life, has the life of God in it. Can you imagine that the word of God that, has, that he has spoken about healing to us is the same word, has the same power as the word that was from the beginning, the which, through which God created all things and the whole world. The same word has life for healing. The same word that created all the living things, the, all humans, all the beautiful landscape, the mountains, the seas, the same word has the same power uh, on healing because God has spoken with his words things about your healing. And it has the same power. And it's this word about healing is just sitting there in the atmosphere, in the heavenly places, in the spiritual realm, waiting to be believed and acted in our lives. Waiting to be used to heal the sick by being believed and spoken. Exactly like the way you've been saved. You believe the word of God that was said about healing to you personally, and then you speak it out. And it has to manifest in your life. And the word of God, if you, if you, if you want, is like, is like a, a law that was set in motion. God has spoken and it's, there, it's like very much like electric, electrical uh, power. It was always there in the atmosphere. It was always in this world. But we had to discover it, discover the, the context, the, the rules, the laws in which the, the electrical power works. And it works all the time uh, if we respect the rules. It's a law that is in, the, in this world, in this universe, and it works every time. It just waits there to be, to be put in the right context. In the same way, we have to align with the word of God on healing. It sits there in the atmosphere, but until we uh, have a, a, an understanding about that word, we have an understanding about how to believe and then speak it out and manifest it in our lives. We have to put ourselves in the, in, the, in, in, in the way of that word so that that word manifests in our lives. And this is so powerful. Uh, one more passage, Hebrews 4 uh, verse 12 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful or active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and in intents of the heart. You see, the word of God is a living entity. That's what I'm trying to, to tell you. It's a living entity. It's alive and active. It's something that is all around us. Heavenly places encapsulates this whole material world, the, the first heaven, second heaven, and the third heaven. is all heavenly places because in the heavenly places we are is also Jesus Christ and the spiritual forces of darkness. They are all in this, in this spiritual realm. The heavenly places are the spiritual invisible realm around us. So in that realm, the word of God is living, is active, is powerful. 
and it's ready to be used by being believed and spoken. It's, and also the word of God is a powerful weapon, this passage says. It's more cutting than any two-edged sword. It's very cutting. You see, these simple words, God has given us such a power. These words are a weapon, a very effective weapon. You think that your words don't mean anything. And you just speak it very lightly. Negative things, but they have power. They have, uh, uh, Carolyn Leaf says that our words, Dr. Carolyn Leaf says that our words are uh, pockets of energy, of quantum energy, either positive or negative. When you speak, when someone speaks a negative thing over you, it can affect your, it can affect your whole life. Your, all your decisions. Is that right? If your parents spoke negative things over you, they have power and they follow you all your life sometimes until you, you find them and you become aware of them and you destroy them by the power of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But words have power and these, the word of God is a weapon in our mouth. It has the power to cut sickness, poverty, lack, fear, uh, uh, um, Sinful habits and sinful, uh, sinful habits, sinful actions uh, in the name of Jesus. This word is so powerful. And let's read one more passage from Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, where it says this. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. You have to know both the scriptures and the power of God so that you will not go into error. Because if you know just the scriptures and you don't know the power, then you will err. In what way? You will change the word of God to fit the experience because you have never known the power of God. So you'll do a, a whole new theology where healing, divine healing, will be kind of out of it. You will not be very much into it. You will not believe into it because you have not known the power of God. But if you know just the power of God, and you don't know the scripture, then again you might error because I've known so, and probably you've seen so many people that had a gift of healing, of faith, and they functioned for a while, but because they didn't have strong scriptures, strong, strong understanding and systematic understanding of scriptures in other areas as well, they knew mostly God's, God's acts, God's deeds, but not his ways of doing things. So they couldn't sustain for a longer term that power, that gift. That's why it's very important to know both the scriptures and the power of God, especially in this area of healing. You need to know how, what God has given us for sure. You need to be persuaded, convinced, so that you can easily believe and so you can, uh, so that you will not be uh, wandered around and wavering in your faith. You have, you need to have a strong faith and, and heal uh, and live in a continuous health for you and for others. Uh, and it's a repeatable fact. It's not something that happens from time to time when God wants. It depends a lot on your faith in the word of God. God has set the word in motion which heals anytime, anyone, anytime, anywhere. But it heals in the according to the power that works through you. And that power, according to the grace that is released through you, and that grace is released, the more you align yourself with that word of God, you believe it and you speak it, and it's part of your nature. That's the secret. That's how things work and, and are manifested in the area of healing. So I think I will, I will close here for today. So today we, we, we started the first chapter, Foundational Truth and Definitions. And we, spoke, we talked about mainly the Word of God as the final authority in our lives. The Word of God has the final word to say, the final authority in our lives. And we need to make that strong in our hearts, put that strong in our hearts because it will help us. This is one principle, one secret by which we will be able to see great revelations on the area of healing from the word of God. Until the next session, I pray that God may bless you and um, help you see new things, open your eyes to more of the things of God and uh, uh, in this area and other areas and in all your life. May God bless you. Amen.